and, more impressively, the 40th book of the Bible. Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. We could all stand for the word, reading of the Word of God. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You may all be seated. I'm going to have to level with you. I've never done an introduction like this before. If you've ever seen the cartoon Kung Fu Panda. uh, So in in the cartoon, the main character, the big panda, Po, Wants to, it loves Kung Fu. And he's picked out as a chosen one. So he goes off to the temple where they're training. And they don't want him there. They think that uh, it was a mistake, that he shouldn't be there. And they're like, okay, well, let's start training. We'll start you at level one. And he's like, is there a level zero? And they're like, no, there's not a level zero. And he starts training. And basically falls through an obstacle course and beats himself up. And when he's done... The master looks at him and says, there is now a level zero. Well, this is discipleship. Most places have discipleship 101 where we start and they cover how to be a disciple, how to grow as a disciple. However, I'm going to say there are many in the church who do not even know that they're supposed to either be a disciple or to teach people and disciple them. So welcome to discipleship level zero. The New Testament pattern is to become a disciple. Acts 11.26 And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. And it's something I love mentioning. It doesn't say go and make... Christians, go and make disciples. They were known as disciples before they were ever known as Christians. And what is a disciple? One thing a disciple is a disciplined learner. Someone who has decided to be a student of something. The pattern laid out in the New Testament is people get saved. That's the first thing. You know, Peter was preaching and, you know, this Christ whom you've had crucified And the people cried out and said, what must we do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe that. I believe in altar calls. I believe in absolutely. We need to teach that you are a sinner. You're born in sin. You sin. You deserve to go to hell by your own actions. Jesus died in your place. And if you will ask him into your heart and you believe that he is the son of God, and God raised him from the dead and confessed that you will be saved. Okay, congratulations. We can call that fire insurance. You've got your bacon out of hell. What next? Well, what next is you already become a disciple. Not a few warmer. Didn't say that. Didn't say Christian. It was become a disciple. The next step on the road of after getting saved is looking at your life and saying, what am I going to do? I'm going to count the cost. And I'm going to go forward, not back. I'm not going to walk away from this thing. I'm going to commit myself to becoming a disciple. Matthew 28, 19, which we'd read earlier here. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
and being the lover of truth that I am, water baptism isn't necessary to get saved, but water baptism is so cool because what it is, is when you got saved, you were born again, the blood of Jesus washed away all your sins. And nobody can see that. Nobody can see that happen. The water baptism is where you go, and on the outside, people can see a representation of what Jesus did on the inside. You go down in the water, and you die to that old life. You die to sin. You are cleansed, and you come up a new creation in Christ. That is cool stuff. And we're asked to do that. But you don't have to be baptized to get saved. Man, it is a good thing to get baptized at least once. I don't believe if you, you, you wake up one morning and the devil whispers in your ear that you're not saved, that you need to go get baptized five days a week just to be sure you're okay. But if you've really gotten saved, you need at least one time make that public confession of this is what Jesus did in my life. I have been cleansed and forgiven. So I can't help myself. This is, exci- this is exciting. It's not even... I don't even have any notes on water baptism. And I'd like to teach about it right now. (laughs) And the word baptismo means to immerse. It's not a little sprinkle of uh, water there. I'll throw that one in for free. You can thank me later. Mark 16. You guys ought to not get me off my notes. Mark 16, 15, and 16. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And then Acts 11.26. Wait, I put that verse down twice. Oh, it's a good verse. We're going to have to do it again. And when he had found him and he brought him to Antioch, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. So we're talking disciples. Jesus raised up disciples. Everyone knows there were 12 disciples who became the 12 apostles. Matthew 4, 18 through 22. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting nets into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them and immediately left their boat and their father and followed him. Jesus made disciples. And boy, we could talk about that for a while. Who could better disciple than Jesus? had the men with them three and a half years, bringing them to the razor edges of discipleship. He is soon to die, be crucified, and go to the Father. And they're sitting there arguing about who should be on his left-hand side and who should be on his right. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane praying where the, the sweat is coming down like blood. And they fall asleep. And he wakes them up. And his number one guy, Peter, what does he say? Lord, it is good that we are here. Why don't we build tents for you? (laughs) You know, just awesome, awesome stuff. Discipling is hard. But Jesus had 12 disciples, and then there were the 70. Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also and sent them by two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves, carrying neither money, bag, knapsack or sandals and greet no one along the road. So he discipled the 12, he discipled the 70. Jesus was a discipler. I'll also mention here, interestingly enough, he says to them, pray. 
that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers into the harvest. The people in this verse that are praying, Lord, send out harvesters, are the ones actually going out not much later. (laughs) So I believe Jesus is asking for us to pray for harvesters. And for those of us that can mentally ascend to this scripture, can follow it, who do you think he's going to have go out in the harvest? It's us. It is us. Paul raised up disciples. Timothy, 1 Corinthians 4.17. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of all my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. There's another place where Paul, um, ta- talking about Timothy, says that he does all things like I do them. He's a disciple. Then we have John Mark. So in the book of Acts, Barat- Barnabas and Paul are on a missionary journey. They're going to churches. They're starting churches. They're working with people. And Barnabas has a nephew, John Mark. Acts 15, 16 through 40. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Now, Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take them with them to the work. Sorry, should not take them with them with one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and had not gone with them on to work. In other words, John Mark jammed on them at some point, was not faithful and flaked. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. So Paul took Silas with him, and I'm going to say discipling Silas, training him as he went. Barnabas took John Mark with him and worked with him. We eventually come to 2 Timothy 4.11, where Paul writes, Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to my ministry. You know, it's sad that Paul and Barnabas no longer work together. You know, even great men of God can have a falling out and disagree over something. But Barnabas knew there was something in, despite the fact, oh man, thank you Jesus, despite the fact that John Mark flaked out. And I can tell you how many times have I seen or been a young Christian, I've been a young Christian who's flaked out. I've seen young Christians flake out. And you know what, man? I had a buddy, Chris, who got saved. And, uh, hey, Chris, let's go to church tonight. He's like, yeah, I'll be there. 7.30, call him at 9 after church. He's like, dude, I fished out. <laughs> and that's what he'd say, dude, I fished out. No problem. We'll, we'll see you Sunday morning. We'll go to church Sunday. Call him at 12, 12.30. Hey, where were you? I'm sorry, dude, I fished out. And just, you know, flaky as all get out. And then amazingly enough, he was hanging out with some of the people from the church, some people he knew, besides me, and uh, somehow they had a conversation while they were like playing Monopoly or something. And he's like, you know what? All right, you know, you guys are right. I'm going to for one month commit myself to show up for everything. And for a month, he made it to everything, and man, the dude caught on fire, got really saved, loves God. Um, I just can't say enough about him. The guy is absolutely awesome. I thought I was smart. He's probably ten times smarter than me now. Never put down, always reading, always studying. Great Bible study leader. Lots of fruit in his life. Lots of people getting saved wherever he's at. Good testimony. And, uh, you know, he started off a absolute flake. The flakiest of the flaky. Yeah, I want to serve God, but I just can't make it to service. I just can't do it. You know, I said I was going to be there Wednesday, but, you know, I have laundry to fold. 
I was going to be there Sunday, but, you know, stayed up a little late Saturday night. Just could not get it right. And, you know, I, when I first time I met him, I just knew there was something about him that God, that, that, that this silly young guy would just get in church and stay in service for a bit and hear the word of God, that something would happen in his heart. But, man, he was a flake. But the same thing here. Barnabas saw in John that there was something there. And he was willing, again, to lose that relationship with Paul, to make a commitment to work with John Mark. And eventually, again, though we never see Barnabas ever mentioned in the Bible again, get Mark and bring him with you, for he is useful to me for my ministry. Absolutely awesome. That Paul said, man, I have, it's critical. I need to get this guy here. He's going to be useful. He's going to be someone faithful. He's going to be someone I can depend upon. And it's not because Pastor Paul saw the potential in the beginning there. Somebody else had to, had to take it up and do it. I, I can't blame Paul. The dude flaked out, man. Right when we needed him most, we were there, and he split. This is, he's not someone useful. He's not someone we can rely on. But Barnabas saw something. I want to mention, next thing, there was a spiritual acceleration that takes place through impartation. One of my favorite things on discipleship, and you could write this down, I don't have it in the notes, more is taught than taught. I guarantee you that. You, you're hanging out with some young Christian and they're with you, and you hit your nail, you hit your thumb instead of the nail, and you start cursing up four-letter words, the young Christian's either going to think you're not a very good testimony or it's okay to cuss. You didn't sit down and teach them whether you should cuss or not. You just simply, through the actuality of your life, lived out who you are, and they picked it up. I can tell you when I talk to people, I go, men, sir, and women, ma'am, and just everyone, I don't care. You can be three years older than me, and I'm going to call you sir. I picked that up from my first pastor. He called everybody sir. And I picked it up. I'm typically in the back running the soundboard, but I'm up here tonight, so I'm standing up here worshiping. And I'm worshiping, I'm just to the beat doing this, which is what my first pastor did 40 years ago, and... Without even thinking about it, I got up and I started doing the things he did. We didn't have a class on how to keep the beat, even if you're not clapping, by using your hand. But it was caught, not taught. Children do this. They play house. And they play dress up. And they don't understand what they're doing when they're playing house. They really don't understand how it works. But they're modeling what they've seen other people do. And eventually, as they get older, it becomes less and less of a game and more and more of things that they know how to do. Learning how to cook. My wife talks about learning how to cook from her mother. In my case, I'll talk about me. I learned how to cook. And I'll be back to, the, to my lovely wife. My mom had horrible health. She was sick. So I'm seven years old, and she'd hand me a $10 bill and tell me to get on my bike, ride down the hill to the store, what ingredients to buy, come back home, and she instructed me, told me what I'd have to do to cook. Because if I didn't cook dinner, I had a brother and two sisters younger than me that wouldn't eat. I didn't pick it up by watching my mom. I had, to, I had kind of on-the-job training. But my, my wife had a much more normal experience where she's in the kitchen with her mom and her mom's doing stuff. And she's sometimes playing, I'm sure when she was real little, you know, mixing stuff and doing things. But she's modeling that behavior. And because her mom is it, mom has to do it. Mom has to put food on the table. Jesus had to go around and minister in the cities. But as the disciples were with him, they picked up things. And part of that is asking him. Jesus would tell these parables, and they'd come to him, and they'd go, Jesus, what do you mean by that? 
Hey, pastor, I saw you do this. Why did you do that? I have that. I told, when I started coming here, I told pastor, I'm going to be here. I'm going to be faithful. And if you do something I don't understand, my ears aren't going to turn red, but I'm going to wait till after service and I'm going to ask you, why are you doing that? I don't understand. There's obviously something I'm missing. Why did you do that? And I'm not talking something unbiblical, just if he does something different than how I've learned how to do it in the past. And it's like, okay, he's doing this differently. There's, there's got to be a reason for this. Let's check it out and find out. Maybe he knows something I don't know. And I like cheap knowledge. Try to drive your car without insurance and find out what happens when you get pulled over. And you get the ticket. And they impound your vehicle. And it's $150 every day. It's at the yard. And you've got to get the money to get the car back out. That's a very expensive way to learn to keep your insurance. It's much easier when you're young to be around someone who's like, man, I've got to make my insurance payment. Well, why do you have to pay your insurance? You don't have enough money for it. Man, I've got to because if I don't and I lose my car, I won't be able to keep my job. Got to have it. Got to do it. And you can learn from somebody else and not have to make a mistake. So when someone does something different, I don't think, oh, man, they're doing that wrong. I think... Maybe they know something. I don't know. Maybe something happened, and they know some little bit of wisdom, a nugget from the Bible. I don't know. And I'd like to get clued in on it. Because it's much cheaper to hear the story about the time pastor had a problem or about the time they almost lost the building because they didn't have faith for God to you know, meet a need than for me to have to go through the same thing when it could have been avoided simply by hearing from someone who's already been there. More is caught than taught, and you are allowed to ask questions. I'm going to go to 1 Kings 19, verses 19 and 21. Talking about Elisha here. Love Elisha. Love everything about Elisha. But we're going to key in on something particular with Elisha and Elijah and Elisha. So he departed from there, that's Elijah, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah. So get that picture there. Elijah comes by, takes off his mantle, representing his ministry, puts it on Elisha, and walks off. Congratulations, dude. You've been appointed to be a prophet. How was God going to talk to him? With uh, Samuel? Samuel would be in bed at night and God would whisper to him. Well, what's going to go on? Well, Elisha left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, please, let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. He's going to follow Elijah. Nobody told him to, but he decided, I'm going to hook up with this guy. He knows something. I'm going to need to go. No, he knows how to be a prophet. I don't. And Elijah said said to him, go back, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment, oxen's equipment and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Something powerful happened here. Elisha sold out. To get into the ministry. He sold out everything. He didn't hold back. 100% commitment. He's making his living with that, with those oxen. The minute you decide to hold a barbecue with them, you're no longer a farmer. That's out the window. He threw in 100%. The same way Peter and John, when Jesus came by and said, come follow me and be a fisher of men, and they got up and left their nets. They left their livelihood. And I'm not asking anyone to leave their livelihood tonight. But there is something that happens when we decide to be a disciple. Elisha made a decision to be a disciple. He made a commitment to it. And he backed that commitment more than talk. I hate saying it, but I've been in church a while. And people will come in from off the street and they may come from another church. Or they may have just been, you know looking for a church, 
and they're like, man, I really like this place. This is great, man. I know exactly what you're doing. I want to be a part of this. And two weeks later, they're gone. Talk is cheap. Talk is easy. You know, I want to be something. I want to do something. And they're gone. Picking up on what Pastor was talking this morning, he was talking about Marion and Ron taking care of the bathrooms. I came from a church that was a, a church that launched out lay ministers. That means people in the church would be ordained and would go out and start a church. My mama church, the church that my church came from, my pastor came from, had Bible studies. And these Bible study leaders with 30 or 40 people in a Bible study, the Bible study would split in half or thirds, 10, 15 people. And these other young guys would then take up that Bible study and grow it. A lot of these Bible study leaders wanted to be preachers. Twice a year they had a Bible conference and they'd launch out four or five new churches. And there were plenty of young guys. You know, man, I love God. I want a pastor. Pastor, look at me. I've got a Bible study here. It's split two times in the last year. It's growing. You know, I'm ready to pastor. I'm ready to go do this thing. So up comes this Bible conference. And sure enough, they launch out three or four pastors. And one of the guys being launched out, the pastor, is a church janitor. He's never taught a Bible study. He's never taken up an offering. He's never led a song service. Matter of fact, most people hardly even noticed him. And he got put out as a pastor. So there were about 15 or 20 Bible study leaders who had a question for their pastor. Why would you send that guy out instead of me? And he says, well, as they're all here complaining about not having your shot to go, this guy's been here for eight years. He's been in the bathroom before and after every service for eight years. No one's ever asked him to do it. No one's ever patted him on the back and told him he did a good job at doing it. And yet he shows up. Every service, absolutely faithful. I know a man like that, that if I give him the responsibility of pastoring a church, he'll be faithful in it. I'm not going to worry about what he's going to do out of town without help if he's going to burn out. This is a guy who will be absolutely faithful because I've seen it for eight years. But again, it's you know, faithfulness in these things matters, and, and, and it comes from places you don't expect. Yes, I'm looking at it, I'm trying to, because a long section of scripture, and I'm trying to think if we want to go for the whole thing or not. And I'm literally so rattled by what I've just said, I forgot what that whole section of scripture is about. <laughs> I guess I'm going to turn there, Second Kings chapter 2. Yep. And as soon as I start reading, I'll know exactly why I'm there. Aha, and now I know why I'm there. Elisha divides the Jordan. So I can talk about this 1 through 18. Elijah is going to be taken up. And Elisha knows this. And Elijah, and Elijah tells Elisha, you just stay where you're at. You don't have to follow. You don't have to go with me. I guess we'll just go ahead and read it since it's already up. Sister, you are a blessing. I, I'm very proud. This is, this, is my, this is my team back here. And they've got, me, they've got my back. Trained well. Probably better than I should take credit for. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by whirlwind that Elisha went to, sorry, Elijah went to Elisha from Gigel. And then Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you, from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elisha 
and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? So he answered, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. And so the two of them went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance, while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water, and it was divided this way and that, and the two of them crossed over on dry ground. And so it was, when they had crossed over, that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what what I may do for you before I am taken away from you. And Elisha said, Please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. And so he said, as you have asked a hard thing, nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, then it shall not be so. And then it happened, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by the whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. Then he also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water... It was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Here we go. Now, when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed to the ground before him. And then they said to him, Look now, we are fifty strong men with your servants. Please let us go and search for your master. Least perhaps the spirit of God had taken him up And cast them upon some mountain or some valley. To me that's just nuts. And he said. You shall not send anyone. But when they urged him. Till he was ashamed. It's like dude don't you know man. This is this is the guy you've been with. If God dropped him off on a mountaintop. You surely wouldn't want to leave him stranded would you. So I said alright. Fine. Go look for him. Send them. And therefore, they sent 50 men, and they searched for three days, but did not find them. And when they came back to him, for they had stayed in Jericho, and he said to them, Did I not say to you, do not go? Elisha was there when Elijah went up. Those 50 guys were on another hill taking notes about what God was doing. They saw from a distance the fiery chariot. They saw Elijah taken up. Only one of them got the... the, double portion it was a guy who was a disciple it was a guy who was right there with him this is important there is something that happens when you're in a real God ordained disciple 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 or disciple relationship when you've made a real commitment not a flaky commitment but you've made a real commitment to God to grow to become who you're supposed to be. Part of it is a love story of literally falling more in love with Jesus than you are right now, of knowing him better. And in that relationship, again, more is caught than taught, and that double portion comes on you. You can read your Bible. You can listen to radio shows about the Bible. You can turn on TV, and you can grow in years and years' time. But there's an acceleration that what could take you years on your own can take a couple years, a year, months, when you're in that relationship. Why don't we want to be disciples? Well... Again, where we started off at, some had no idea that they were called to be a disciple. That part of getting saved is that they would become a disciple. Because in our society, we talk about being Christians. You show up at church, and you say you're saved, you're a Christian. 
and that's all there is to it. And take what you want from it. Some churches, we get together and we have, uh, you know, um, potlucks, and we kind of hang together. You join the church choir. Some people show up at church on Sunday and then do things that would be an embarrassment if anyone in the church knew the rest of the week. But all, most of those folks have no idea they're, they're actually asked to be a disciple. For those of us that do know we should be a disciple, there are people who are not ready to commit 100%. My buddy Chris spent three months flaking out, not coming to church, because he was not ready to commit. And there literally was a moment, while pl- again, plain monopoly, that he said, you know what, I'm going to go in 100% for a month and see where this gets me. We don't like denying ourselves. We are told that we need to take up our cross daily. We have to crucify the flesh. Being in a relationship like that, again, involves us spending time with someone. You're going to have to change your schedule to be discipled. And again, there is a cost to be a disciple. Elisha sold out 100%. Anybody here not happy at where you're at in the walk with God. You're not happy. You could be further. You know there's more. And you see other people sometimes that have it and you don't. Want spiritual growth? Sell out 100%. One of the best things I ever heard, and this is a spiritual truth. We, churches now don't talk a whole lot about revival like they used to, but revival. This is a nugget. Write this down if you have a pen and paper. Revival goes to the highest bidder. And that's not saying we can outbid the Baptist church down the street on revival. You know who gets revival? The people that are at 100% that want it. And if you want it 100% and this church wants it 100% and some other church down the street only wants it 90% and don't quite put all into it, I can tell you revival is going to go. And the same goes for us. If we only want it 95%, and there is some church down the street that wants it 100%, they'll be getting something we're not getting here. Revival goes to the highest bidder. That's just the way it is. And as true as it is for the church, it's for our personal life as well. How come someone else is growing and I'm not? Well, maybe they're giving more. And they're giving more can be giving less. Don't take this the wrong way, but if you're not real smart and you don't have a lot of money and you can't do that much, if you're doing 100%, God's going to bless that. And there can be someone else who can be slacking off and doing more than you and know more than you. They can read and pray more than you, but they can do more and they know they can do more. They know God has asked them to do more and they're not. They're not going to be experiencing the same thing as a dude who's putting in 100% even if it's less than you're putting in. God's not judging me by anyone else in this church. God's not going to come to me and say, you know what, man? You don't pray as much as he does. God's not going to come to me and say, you know what, dude? You are not as good to your wife as Charles is at taking care of his marriage. Ain't what God's going to do. God's going to come to me and say, look, dude, this is where you're falling short. You need, this is where you need to improve. This is what you need to go for. And it doesn't matter. Well, I don't beat my wife like so-and-so. That's not the measure if I'm doing good with my marriage or not. The measure if I'm doing good with my marriage or not is if, you know, God whispers in my ear, you know what? That little argument you guys just had, you were the one that's wrong. You need to apologize. I can't say, well, Jesus, you know what? At least I didn't slap her. (laughs) That doesn't work. We have to be willing to die to the flesh, take up our cross. We have to be willing to pay a price. And something else, you know what? It can be limited, like with the ark. Remember, 120 years, Noah's building the ark. 
the animals coming up two, two by two, and then the door closes and that's it. You know what? There's somebody, if, you, if you're ready to be discipled, there's someone there to disciple you. God has someone out there. And if you play around and don't go for it, maybe God will bring someone else for the disciple and you're out this round. Maybe I'll have to wait a few more years. And we're on to our bonus section tonight. Mature Christians, welcome to level zero of being a discipler. You need to be discipling someone. If you're mature enough, you can put one foot in the other, after the other. And it's not a constant battle to say saved every day of the week. If you're not always on the verge of totally blowing it, and you have some maturity, you ought to be available to disciple somebody else. You ought to be available so that something that's in your life can transfer to theirs. And that's a horrifying thought sometimes. <laughs> what if <laughs> transferring from my life is not something I like? Well, that's unfortunately part of the thing is you're going to transfer who you are. And we can see that in the Bible. With Samuel. Samuel was raised by Eli the priest. His sons were evil and wicked. And though Samuel became a prophet, grew up and did well, Samuel's sons were also wicked, just like Eli's sons were wicked. Where did Samuel learn to raise kids from? Watching Eli. And Samuel made the same mistakes that Eli made. More is taught than taught. Anyways, a trendy term for the last 20 years for discipling is mentoring. I'm mentoring someone. Ah, oh, it's fancy. You can go down to, the, down to the bookstore and buy plenty of Christian books on mentoring. Or you can pick up a Bible, which you probably already own, at no additional cost to you, and read about discipling. It's about the same thing. And there is a cost to mentoring. Second Samuel 24, 24. And then the king, we're talking King David. This is after he decided to have a census and a plague was sent out. He's going to make an offering to God so that this plague will stop. And then the king and it comes to this guy's threshing floor, wants to buy it from him. And the guy's like, no, I'll give it to you. Then the king said to Aruna, no, I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God on that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver. There are no, you know what? You're going to have to pay a price, just as well as a disciple he is. As a disciple, you're going to have to pay a price. It's going to cost you time, it's going to test your patience. You know, just like in the garden with Adam and Eve, you know, here are the rules, dude. Eat anything you want but that tree. And he fails. Your disciple will be able to understand the fact that they should do this or that and that that is bad and it will hurt them and this is good and they'll still occasionally do that thing that's bad. And you'll wonder, how in the heck can they keep doing that? Because they know better. And I've taught them better. And you'll want to rip out your hair. <laughs> But you've got to keep, you know, you got to keep on soldiering through that. There are no shortage of people that need to be discipled. Many of them are like mules. They need to be pointed in the right direction and encouraged to get to work. In the best way possible, you should be provoking people to jealousy. Young Christians should want what you have. And that also means not getting all cold and crusty with a bad attitude as you get older in the Lord. You know what? Why can't you have a first love when you've been saved for 20 years? Man, I know a man in this church who gets excited every time someone comes to the altar. And he's got a good 25 or 30 years on me. And man, you, there's no one more excited than him when someone gets saved. Man, he's, he comes into church, I think he's scanning to see, man, who's here that might get saved today? He's looking for it. He's excited about it. He wants to see the kingdom of God just one person bigger today. And the, we need that kind of heart. We need to have an excitement about the things of God. Young Christians should want what you have. 
and you should take an opportunity to point them in the right direction. Here's a pro tip. Here's another one to be written down. As a discipler, you are always pointing people to Christ, not yourself. Being a discipler is like being a parent. If my son is 45 years old and is still in diapers and is dependent on me to take care of him, I'm not doing a very good job as a parent. My son, if I do a good job as a parent, should grow up to be a responsible person who can eventually leave home, function in society, pay bills, not end up in jail, get married, have a wife, have kids, be able to function by himself doing all that as well or better than me. I've succeeded as a parent. As a discipler, if you have someone who's a disciple for 15 years, they're probably not doing something right. They should be able to grow up, become mature. And one of the last things you do as a discipler is you turn them loose to have a disciple and disciple someone. Now, it doesn't mean the relationship goes away forever. You can still go back to the person that disciple you and ask questions. But that relationship of that closeness of discipling ends. Jesus did it for three and a half years, and then it was no longer the same relationship. But everything healthy, every healthy organism reproduces. So, as a Christian, a healthy Christian will be able to reproduce. Some people go out and and witness and get people saved, and I have a really skill at that. Other people are here in church to encourage But I'm telling you, there are those of you here that don't even know what you're here to disciple someone. You're here to take someone under your wing. Someone who may not be really knowing what's going on, but they become willing. And they decide they're going to put in 100%. And you can train them and work with them. Someone invested in you. You need to pass it on. Don't bury your talent. Freely you have been given, so freely give. You can't disciple if there's not someone willing to sell out and be a disciple. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. And I've talked to somebody who's like, man, I really worked at this thing. We got to put this class together, and there's a discipleship class, and all these guys were coming, and uh, something happened, and we had to postpone a class, and we had to postpone a second class, and the next thing I know, they're all gone. You can do what you want. You can pray. You can pound your head. But if the person who is to be the disciple will not be willing to kick in 100%, you're not going to get results. It may not be you, but man, you need to be available so it can be you to actually disciple. In closing, my sister here will put the verse up for me. Proverbs 23, 7. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What are you in your heart? Who are you? What have you purposed to do? I can tell you who I am. And I mean this. I know who I am. I am a disciple. That's, I don't think of myself as a Christian. I am a disciple. From day one, I was a disciple. I got saved. I became a disciple. I am a man who is willing to to be a disciplined learner, to sell out and pay a price to follow Jesus. I am now a discipler. I am a man who is a molder of men in Christ Jesus, a man who is willing to pay a price to invest in others. I don't want anything from someone I'm discipling. If I'm not investing in them, that it doesn't cost me something, I'm not doing my job right. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. In closing, I'm asking right now, What have you purposed in your heart concerning discipleship? That is it. We're going to close this thing in prayer. Dear Father God, come before you this night. We have heard your word, and I pray that it would take root where you desire it to take root. And I would pray for those that would say, you know what, I want to grow. Lord, I'm willing to be a disciple. Put someone in my life to disciple me. And for those who are mature, by whatever measure they consider maturity, would go, you know what, Lord? I am willing to disciple. I am willing to have, allow some Christian who is not mature come up alongside me. And I am willing to impart from my life into theirs. 
that they could grow up to be the Christian that they are to be. And I would pray that this night in Jesus' name. Amen. For those of you that are here online, we appreciate that you spent time with us tonight. We will see you Wednesday night at 6 p.m. when we'll be talking more on worship. And I would say if you've not been here for it, you need to come down and be a part of it. Amen and good night.